And a lot of people who say the bum can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. The Second World War is said to have begun proper when Germany invaded Poland and Britain and France declared war. In reality, this war, like all other wars, was the final instalment of decades of political tensions and a continuation of an earlier conflict, the First World War. Poland, a poor country whose people suffered under a harsh dictatorship and a low standard of living, was quickly overrun by the German military machine. The Polish national budget was smaller than that of the city of Berlin and could never hope to fend off the German forces. Soviet armies arrived shortly before the shooting had finished to occupy eastern provinces. These sections of old Poland have never been returned and are now provinces of modern day Ukraine and Belarus. Poland was given a slice of eastern Germany after the war in compensation. In preparation for a war of air supremacy, the Germans developed sophisticated air defences among them was the unpronounceable German highest scoring scrabble word that you can see on the screen, which means pilot warding off cannon. This was shortened to flak by 1938. The RAF's first encounter with flak was during the German invasion of France, as British bombers tried to destroy a pontoon bridge built by Rommel over the Meuse River in the Ardennes. 40 out of 73 planes were shot down during this endeavour, mostly by flak. Figurative metaphoric use was first recorded in 1963, in 1939, Paramount Pictures released Geronimo. It was a B-grade western. The plot revolved around the rogue Indian chief Geronimo and his tribe who are making trouble and up to no good. The cavalry, of course, won the day. Those who were fond of the film included members of the 82nd Airborne Division based in Fort Benning, Georgia. This division were among the first troops to be selected for the new tactic of parachute deployment. The troops took to shouting Geronimo before jumping by 1939. There are other competing accounts of how this phrase came into the English language. It is possible that the phrase entered independently elsewhere, given the popularity and widespread dissemination of, of the film. However, this account is the only one to have ever been documented, and let the viewer be the judge of that. Another American military colloquialism from 1939 is Brown Nose. Not much else is known about this phrase, and not much else needs to be said about its meaning. US bombers were equipped with uh, alarm systems in the event of an emergency. When the pilot determined that the aircraft could not reach its destination, he would hit the panic button, notifying the crew to bail out. One of the many uh, technological advances leading up to the Second World War was the backpacked two-way radio manufactured by Motorola. One soldier would carry it on his back, so that another could use the device while standing behind him. This device was called a walkie-talkie by the troops by 1939. This model was in widespread use by the Marines fighting on islands in the Pacific. Motorola also produced a similar handheld transceiver device that operated independently. It is this uh, kind of portable device that we would call a walkie-talkie today, but at the time, this device was called a handy-talkie. Germany uh, produced and made far better use of superior wireless handsets. RAF pilots could talk to each other and to ground control using the intercommunication system, or intercom, by 1940. Belt up, meaning to be quiet, was also RAF slang from the late 1930s. US Navy pilots learned to fly at the Naval Air Station at Corpus Christi, Texas. George H.W. Bush trained at the station in 1943 and became the youngest pilot to receive his wings. The cadets were credited with the first use of the word raunchy. It originally meant a clumsy, careless or sloppy, possibly derived from rancho, a Spanish borrowing meaning ranch, bringing uh, connotations of the filth of a stable. Its usage with uh, sexual connotations was first recorded in 1967. A flyer in the US military earned the name uh, Flyboy by 1937. In 1940, the Soviet Union invaded Finland. A common example of Finnish black humor at the time was the antidote. 
There are so many, and our country is so small. Where shall we find room to bury them all? The Finns put up a brave defence and made the most of what they had. Finnish sniper Saima Haya killed over 500 Soviet troops. He lived to be 96. The Finnish defenders adopted an effective and easy to produce weapon. First known to be used in the Spanish Civil War, a bottle filled with something flammable with an oily rag in the hole as a fuse. They would light the rag and throw it at something Russian. The Finns initially named this a uh, Molotov breadbasket, and the name soon changed to Molotov cocktail. They named the improvised bomb in honor of the Soviet foreign minister. Molotov was a uh, pseudonym. His real name was, um, it's there on the screen. Uh, Molot uh, in Russian means a hammer. It uh, apparently gave him an air of communist, hard-working, patriotic ardor. The Finns inflicted uh, heavy casualties on the Soviet invaders, whose military was still reeling from Stalin's blood purges in the 30s. The resourceful Finns could inflict many of these casualties by the use of booby traps, such as mines triggered by uh, tripwires. Stalin's army and its accompanying artillery eventually overwhelmed these plucky Finns. During the firebombing of Japanese cities in 1944, the long stick-like incendiary bombs dropped by the American B-29s were nicknamed Molotov breadsticks by the Japanese. Denmark and Norway were the first Western European countries to be invaded. Hitler needed to protect his supply of iron ore from Sweden and counter the effect of the inevitable British naval blockade that had been instrumental to Germany's defeat in the First World War. When the Germans were entering Norway, the fascist and anti-Semitic politician, Vic King Quisling, sought to head up a puppet regime. He stormed a radio station and broadcast a proclamation naming himself leader and ordering, with no actual authority to do so, a cessation of resistance. With a, a population of only about 3 million people and a small irregular army, the Norwegian people were helpless against such wanton aggression and treachery. He uh, only remained ruler for six days in the role of Prime Minister. Nonetheless, he was an enthusiastic Nazi supporter, especially when the Nazis were winning. With a head for administration and serving in separate roles, he and the Norwegian bureaucracy assisted with the registering and deporting of Norwegian Jews. He was a reappointed Prime Minister in 1942. On April 15th, 1940, the London Times was first to use Quisling with a lowercase q to signify treachery and cowardice. When it was clear that the Nazis would be defeated, he did what he could to assist the Allies, alas to no avail. He was convicted of treason after the war and was executed by firing squad in October 1945, unrepentant and protesting his innocence until the end. Although Quisling is falling out of common usage in English, it still features in many languages. His treachery contrasts sharply with the dignity of the pre-occupation Norwegian king, Hakon uh, VII, who chose to abdicate rather than recognise Quisling or collaborate with the Nazis. The German method of fighting was called Blitzkrieg, which means lightning war. A Blitzkrieg attack typically featured a highly concentrated mechanised army attack with a close air support. Speed and coordination were exploited for quick victories against countries that still had our cavalry regiments and relied on messengers to relay news of military manoeuvres. The Germans ran roughshod over their neighbours. By the summer of 1940, it was Britain's turn. German planes commenced a uh, sustained bombing campaign in preparation for an apparent invasion. The campaign of Blitzkrieg was shortened to Blitz as the Battle of Britain commenced in September 1940. London was bombed for 57 consecutive nights except one, by an average of 160 uh, bombers per night. Moreover, to blitz was also used as a verb to describe what was uh, happening on the ground. A destroyed building was said to have been blitzed. A second bombing campaign of London occurred from uh, January to April 1944, remembered as the Baby Blitz. The verb usage picked up in 1957 in reference to impressive American football manoeuvres. The figurative noun usage, such as uh, advertising blitz, is far more uh, common and began soon after the term was coined. Shortly before the US entered the war in late 1941, the soldiers already seemed to know what to expect in terms of the fog of war. SNAFU was originally a soldierly acronym. It stood for Situation Normal, All Failed or Fucked Up. The slang term was then used uh, to name the lead character in a series of instructional cartoons produced for the service personnel. The short animated films were considered a military secret. 
They contain, by the standards of the day, quite adult and racing material. The foolhardy private snafu character found himself in all sorts of predicaments by which methods are uh, serve to educate soldiers not otherwise malleable to the various training methods by the US military. Illiterate or low IQ uh, recruits were not excluded from service. By uh, 1944, the acronym FUBAR was coined, standing for fucked up beyond all recognition. FUBAR fell by the wayside before being uh, repopulized by the 1998 film by Steven Spielberg, Saving Private Ryan. Like Snafu, uh, the F in FUBAR was uh, altered to failed in polite usage. Boot camp was 1941 US Army rank and file parlance. As recruits shipped out, most left their spouse or partner behind. Their agitation and anxiety in regard to the fidelity of their lovers was articulated by the term Jody. Uh, the word Jody is a clipping of uh, Jody Grinder, a mythical character from the jazz scene. Jody Grinder was the guy who would steal your girl, whether you were in the service or in a prison, first used in this uh, pre-war sense in 1939. African-American recruits brought the term to uh, the various branches. The US Army, Navy and Royal Navy seem to have developed a task force system at around the same time in 1941, with its, uh, the exact origins of this term is not known. As it uh, pertains to the Navy, a, a task force was a group of ships formed from different sections of the Navy, assembled together for a specific purpose. As it pertained to a committee, the phrase uh, caught on to replace the more old-fashioned and less impressively sounding expression, ad hoc committee. Jeep also appeared in 1941, with uh, various stories as to its origin. The uh, best of a bunch of bad stories is that Jeep was a derivation of a GP, standing for general purpose. It may also have been supported by uh, Eugene the Jeep, a uh, Popeye comic strip character. As well as being a kind of utility vehicle, Jeep also referred to a class of escort aircraft carrier. As the Royal Air Force began bombing Germany, they found an expression to describe what was happening. The sound of the uh, destruction caused by the bombs sounded like clobber. When a place was bombed, it was clobbered. A similar expression that arose from this period was prang, for the sound of an aircraft or bomb crashing at high speed. Prang was coined in the same way by the RAF that conk out was coined. Unlike conk out, however, prang never made its way into US English. The days when the British shaped the language was dying out, and American linguistic hegemony was emerging. Nonetheless, the RAF servicemen of the day still saw fit to modify the American expression piece of cake to piece of piss. American soldiers nicknamed their 2.36 inch handheld anti-tank rocket, the Brazooka, after a small improvised uh, wind instrument, the Brazooka, used by comedian Bob Burns. The original Brazookas were not effective weapons and did not bother the German tanks too much. Until the invasion of the continent could be executed, British commanders took the view that aerial bombing was the only means available to hinder German war potential. Early in the war, Bomber Command could not always guarantee they could accurately hit a city, let alone military targets, until target finding technologies were developed. Bombs and bombing methods got bigger and better. A large barrel shaped bomb of 4,000 pounds or larger was by 1942 referred to by the media as a blockbuster. It was used exclusively by the RAF, who were more comfortable with the strategy of area bombing to which the blockbuster was useful. The USAAF had a doctrine of precision bombing, and their planes were not yet capable of carrying this heavy weapon. The American aversion to area bombing waned as the war progressed. Blockbuster was named as such by the press because it could supposedly destroy a whole city block. This was not the weapon's real uh, function. The methods of bombing missions varied and um, developed in effectiveness over the course of the war. But a typical bombing mission t um, towards the end of the war often involved hundreds of aircraft of various types would go uh, something like this. First, there would be a master bomber circling and directing air traffic. Simultaneously, wooden mosquito fighter bombers would drop flares to eliminate the target city. Larger bombing aircraft would locate and fan out upon identification of the eliminated target indicators. Huge high explosive bombs such as a blockbuster, known in the service as cookies or the cookie cutter, created large craters hampering the efforts of firefighters. Other aircraft dropped cluster and blast bombs, which would shatter windows and punch holes in roofs in order to create drafts. They were followed by incendiary bombs, which engulfed the shattered city in flames and wreaked havoc, death and destruction. Finally, time-delayed mines were dropped in order to hamper recovery efforts and spread terror and misery. These kinds of raids created what were 
would be, by 1945, be described as a firestorm. Firestorm was attested after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and originally referred to that nuclear event. However, it was subsequently used retroactively to refer to any destruction of a city by bombs and incendiaries. Hamburg, Cologne and Dresden were all completely destroyed by firestorms, resulting in appallingly high civilian death rates. In the case of Dresden, the British destroyed the city by night. The next day, the Americans flew over the already destroyed city to drop bombs on the rubble ash and the dead and dying civilians. The Dresden raid was personally approved by Churchill in order to demonstrate support for the advancing Soviet army. It was, however, a political disaster. The city was full of refugees, and the death toll is estimated to be between uh, 20,000 and 50,000 people. World War II aerial bombing killed well over a million civilians. The tactic was diabolically effective on Japan and its cities of largely wooden buildings. The blockbusters were used in 1945 to train for the dropping of the first atomic bombs. The crews uh, renamed their weapons Pumpkin and it served as a substitute for the heavier nuclear devices the Air Force expected to deliver. The training raised the three B-29 bombers to fly in formation and practice dropping the five-ton weapons were known as the uh, pumpkin raids. In 1955, Blockbuster was uncharitably used as a way to describe the African-American family moving into a white neighborhood and was used to refer to successful theater productions uh, by 1957. Among those sent to fight the Japanese in the Pacific was the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion, better known as Carlson's Raiders. Carlson, a lieutenant colonel and a commander of the battalion, found the strict hierarchical structure of the Marines unsatisfactory for the raiding and guerrilla tactics that he was expected to carry out. Familiar with both Chinese and Japanese military structures, he advocated a more collaborative approach to mission planning. He drew on what the Chinese referred to as Kung Ho, which means collaborate or work together. The purpose of a Kung Ho meeting was not only to detail the mission, but to explain the reasons why they were doing it and to initiate an open dialogue with everyone involved. He had the good sense to understand that if you were to ask a man to risk his life, you had better tell him why. Kung Ho morphed into Gung Ho by 1942 and was adopted as the uh, division motto. Gung Ho came into widespread usage by 1957. However, the meaning had dramatically shifted to refer to the macho ethic in association with the image the Marines had made for themselves, with the assistance of Hollywood actors such as John Wayne glorifying their exploits. With most American resources going to the European theatre, the US Navy agreed on a strategy of island hopping by the men and material they had. The idea was to bypass heavily fortified locations in favour of strategically useful island bases for an eventual invasion of Japan. Despite most of the equipment earmarked for the D-Day invasion, there was still a wide range of impressive amount of gear slowly sailing and inching its way towards Japan. Equipment ranged from the very big, such as aircraft carriers, to the very small and functional, such as customised spanners used to set the depth of the depth charges. Much of the equipment were new inventions and purpose-made. Anything that the sailors or marines could not put a name to was dubbed a gizmo, first attested in 1942 and first recorded in July 1945 in Life magazine. It is not certain where the word came from. One possibility is that it was a derived from gadget, which was pretty sailor slang for the same kind of thing. With all the men at war, this created a labour shortage. Many of the men left were those too young, too old or incapable of whatever reason to serve in the armed forces. Employers were forced to choose those not selected by military recruiters who were not known for being overly selective. Factors such as literacy, criminal records or age requirements were commonly overlooked. Employers were said to scrape the bottom of the barrel in order to fill vacancies. The men away from home and shortages of their own, among those a lack of female company. A pin-up of a female celebrity was often the best substitute that could be mustered. Pin-up was a uh, common noun to describe the posters and the agent noun to describe the uh, woman was attested by 1943. Common pin-ups were Rita Hayworth, Ava Gardner and Betty Grable. Another way to keep warm was to wear the long underwear issued to them dubbed Long Johns. A common weapon in the US military arsenal was the M1 Garland rifle, a semi-automatic weapon with an eight round clip. To operate the rifle, the clip is loaded into the rifle's internal magazine and then locked into his position by operating the rifle bolt. This action was articulated by the expression load and lock. This expression uh, load and lock featured in the 1942 film In the Army. 
or the first known recording of Load and Lock, was in a War Department dispatch from the Philippines in 1899. The eight rounds could then be fired as fast as the operator could pull the trigger. Seven years after In the Army, The Sands of Iwo Jima starring John Wayne was released. A scripted line featured the expression, Load and Lock, as Marines were approaching Betio Island in the Tara Atoll. The actor playing the Marine skipper or captain first delivered a line, Lock and Load. John Wayne repeated the phrase later in a film as his character John Stryker, as he was about to enter a bar, and one more time before his squad landed on Iwo Jima. It is, of course, impossible to lock something before you load it. The line is believed to have been misarticulated by the actors. The story is disputed, particularly by those familiar with the uh, particular rifle. An alternative theory was that lock and load is actually the correct way to refer to the uh, operation of the M1 Garland rifle weapon. This line of reasoning goes along something like this. In order to prepare the rifle for operation, the uh, operator bolt is pulled back and locked, as it were. Then the clip is loaded. This is an accurate description of the operation of the weapon, and may well have been coined by operators of the rifle during the war. Nonetheless, there is no known recording of lock and load prior to the 1949 John Wayne movie. The logic of locking and loading the rifle appears to have been uh, applied retrospectively, although the fact that, that the phrase has not been recorded does not suggest the phrase was not in vernacular use. Let the viewer be the judge. U.S. aviators were credited with the first figurative use of the expression to separate the men from the boys. Before the war, there was a shortage of experienced pilots. Recruits were usually young college students, often still immature and adolescent in character. When a British pilot had a fatal incident in his aircraft, he was said to have bought it. Bought it was derived from brought the farm, an earlier expression to denote death. The imposition of American English during the war confused the British and the Germans alike. German intelligence intercepted US Army force radio transmissions and deduced that the Americans were stockpiling toxic gas in North Africa. The gas that the Americans were referring to over the radio was in fact petroleum. Trigger happy is from 1943 and was the first of many compounds with happy at the end to indicate one's orientation, usually with sardonic connotations. Bomb happy and flak happy soon followed. Rock happy came about by 1945 in reference to constant island hopping and referred to the mental instability resulting from such ongoing deployments. Other memorable instances since the war include slap happy and wire happy. Submarines and U-boats proved to be very effective weapons to defeat an enemy's ability to wage war. They were used very effectively by the Germans to deny Britain vital supplies and by the Americans in the Pacific against the Japanese. The Allies did not have a good word to describe the air shaft and periscope unique to the submarines. Snorkel was appropriated to describe it. The German spelling was uh, anglicised to snorkel by 1949. A snorkel reduced the U-boat's radar detectability with so many different theatres of war. It was not always easy to get supplies into a given area, especially on remote highlands in the Pacific. Marines and other servicemen needed to improvise, reuse, recycle and make do with what equipment they had at hand. The practice of taking parts from an old piece of equipment to use elsewhere was to cannibalise and reuse the old parts. Making broken down equipment work again was a wartime necessity. Anne Frank was discovered and taken away shortly after writing that statement. The Nazi systematic campaign of murder and extermination of European Jewry was in full swing by 1944. It had begun at the onset of the war after Poland was invaded. The pernicious anti-Semitic ideology of the Nazis and a devastatingly efficient bureaucratic machine allowed for unimaginable crime against humanity to occur. News of the atrocities was slow to filter through to the Allies. People had a hard time believing such things were really happening. Disguised as a railway station, Treblinka was exclusively a death camp. Treblinka and camps like it were a typical camp referred to in German as either, uh, you can see that on the screen, that means extermination camp, or Todschlager, meaning death camp. The Nazis murdered somewhere between 700,000 and 900,000 people in Treblinka alone. Victims were murdered in, an, in a variety of ways before gassing became the standard method. Exposure, starvation, suicide and disease contribute to the large numbers of fatalities. In total, one in ten fatal victims of the Nazis was a Jew. 
Final Solution was attested in 1947 and translation of the German Endosling, uh, the official name of the murderous German policy from 1941. By 1942, the gas chamber method became the preferred way to murder death camp victims. Victims, unbeknown to them right up until the last minute, were taken to gas chambers and murdered with Cyclone B, a cyanide-based commercial product. It was previously used either as a, a ship disinfectant, pesticide, or for delousing. The main Auschwitz concentration camp complex gas chamber could hold uh, about 2,000 victims at one time. Those selected for extermination were told they would be deloused. The men, women and children were assembled before a chamber, simply marked a bath at its entrance. While waiting, an orchestra made up of inmates played light tunes of more peaceful times familiar to the victims in order to keep the condemned calm. Before they were herded into an airtight chamber and killed, they were given towels. When the victims had perished, they were taken to a giant purpose-built crematoria. Genocide was coined in 1944 by Polish writer and jurist Raphael Lemkin in his work Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, but was not widely used in English until the 1946 Nuremberg Trials for Crimes Against Humanity. Genocide consists of a blend of two Greek morphemes, genos meaning race or tribe and side meaning to kill. Both Anne and her sister Margaret died at Bergen-Belsen. The systematic murder of European Jewry by the Nazis was first referred to by the Yiddish word you can see on the screen. The, um, this word means a destruction in Yiddish. The Israelis use and still use the word Shoah. The first known documentation of Holocaust in this context was in 1942 in the private co correspondence of President of the World Zionist Organization, Charm Wasman, and appeared again in sel seldomly read uh, scholarly works from time to time. A 1959 New York Times article used the term, but widespread usage began not until uh, 1961, at and after the trial of Adolf Eichmann. The simultaneous uh, translation used Holocaust to translate the G Hebrew word Ashoah. Holocaust dates from the 13th century and is of a Greek um, etymology. It was taken from the Bible and originally referred to the uh, burnt offerings to God. It was never used uh, during the Nuremberg trials. Holocaust had some rarefied use before its current form, sometimes appearing in newspaper articles about arson fatalities. Act 5 of uh, Peter Pan featured Captain Hook delivering the line, A Holocaust of Children. The historical event became known as the Holocaust with the upper uppercase H around the beginning of 1970, shifting the uh, word, word class from a common noun to a proper noun. And from here on, and this I refer to this specific event, the 1970s saw an increase in interest in the Holocaust and Holocaust studies. This convention likely started after the Library of Congress added the new category Holocaust Jewish to its list of categorizations in 1968. In 1978, NBC aired a miniseries simply called Holocaust. This was a significant in tracing the semantic progress of Holocaust, as no grammatical modifier or extra explanations. Uh, information was added, the viewers automatically understood its meaning. There are now at least 75 museums and memorials worldwide with the word Holocaust in their names. Holocaust can still be used in other contexts such as a nuclear holocaust but would now require a modifying noun at its head. The Shell Fuel Company ran an advertisement in Life magazine on January 24 which read, Out for blood, our Navy throws everything but the kitchen sink at the Jap, at the Jap vessels, warships and transports alike. Variations of this phrase existed from early 20th century American colloquial pilots, but was first documented in this current form in this Life magazine advertisement and was henceforth crystallised and attested. As the Americans closed in to the home islands of Japan, the Japanese became more and more desperate to fend off the pending invasion. The Japanese soldier believed there was no greater disgrace than to surrender. Most Japanese people believed their emperor was a god, that their lives belonged to him, and they were destined to die and defend his reign. Defeat was unthinkable, and any private reservation could not be publicly aired. A Japanese serviceman was subjected to imprisonment or death if he appeared to articulate any kind of doubt or defeatism. 
The first kamikaze attacks occurred in October 1944 off Leyte Gulf. Five Zero aircraft with bombs lashed to their wings attacked the attacked the U.S. fleet supporting operations to retake the Philippines. It caused the sinking of the uh, USS St. Lo, an escort carrier. When the Americans invaded the southern island of o Okinawa, the first large-scale kamikaze attack took place. The kamikaze created terror and caused significant damage to the invasion fleet. 1,700 kamikaze attacks occurred during the Battle of Okinawa. Despite the high losses and an incredibly unnerving psychological effect, the invasion went ahead and Okinawa was taken after a vicious contest. Kamikaze was attested in English in 1945 after the Battle of Okinawa. All aircraft suicide missions were called kamikaze by the Americans. In Japanese, these were called uh, tokubetsu kogekitai, which meant special attack unit. Kamikaze was first used to refer to the units of the men involved. In Japanese history and folklore, kamikaze, meaning divine wind, was a name given to a typhoon that destroyed Mongolian invasion fleets in the 13th century. The Battle of Okinawa saw the death of the much-loved war correspondent, Ernie Pyle. He was killed by Japanese machine gun fire while visiting GIs on Iishima, a small island off the coast of Okinawa. Contrary to popular mythologies both in Japan and the West, the kamikaze were not zealous volunteers, cheerfully gliding off to Nirvana. Many of them were compelled to join the regiments with uh, pressure tactics and intimidations. The Japanese Tokubetsu Koto Keisetsu, Toko for short, meaning special higher police, was the regime's instrument of dangerous thought, suppression. It was possible to be arrested, convicted and sent to prison merely for having the wrong opinion. The use of torture in order to extract confessions was commonplace. The organization had tremendous reach, with branches in every Japanese city and large town. Agents were even stationed overseas in places like Shanghai, London and Berlin, where there were Japanese communities. The organization had been dubbed the Thought Police by 1945. The term was further popularized by George Orwell in his 1948 novel 1984, where the fictional Thought Police of Britain, renamed Airstrip One, ruthlessly repressed the act of thought or opposition to a pernicious Big Brother regime. Like in all wars, large numbers of men congregated and shared their colloquialisms. British English entered American English, and vice versa. More often than not, it was the Americanisms entering British English. Being lost on patrol was to be up the creek. A reconnaissance mission had been shortened to recon by World War I and to recce by 1941. An American serviceman would uh, refer to his home country as stateside. Gigantic merged with enormous to form ginormous the same year. Much of this slang, while undoubtedly used during the war, would not be attested until years after. Strip search is a reference to um, prisoners in an Allied POW camp by 1947. Something half-baked or substandard was piss poor. An enemy aircraft was a bogey, from the golfing term. To have too much work was to be snowed under. To be upset was to be pissed off. Uh, note here the RAF fixation on urine. Another piece of Cockney slang, in this instance a piece of Cockney um, rhyming slang used in the barracks was get on my wick. Uh, wick rhymes with prick. When the soldiers returned home, they returned. They continued to use military abbreviations such as R&R. &R. These examples of barracks language is a mere smattering of what existed. There are hundreds more examples of World War I and World War II slang that could be mentioned. Most slang from the World Wars has fallen out of regular use, and their word origins are hardest to verify. Some expressions such as the vulgar but useful American slang word bullshit uh, pre-existed the war, but rose from obscurity by men dealing with all kinds of it. All sides engaged in a secret technological war. This war of intellect, fought in the mines and the ether, was every bit as important and deadly as the battlefields. The best minds in Britain were assembled to outsmart the enemy. Among them was Peter Hilton, who worked at the government code and cipher station at Bletchley Park, or Station X as it was then referred to. Hilton, among with su others such as Alan Turing, decoded uh, German wireless transmissions. The scientists fighting the secret war, mostly civilians in uniform, became known as boffins, 
a literary reference to Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. Boffin was simultaneously used to refer to any elderly naval officer. The term was broadly used to refer to scientists working at various facilities such as the Admiralty Research Laboratory in Teddington, the Telecommunications Research Establishment located at the uh, Requisition Melbourne College and the Photographic Reconnaissance Unit at Benson and as scientific officers attached to the defence ministries. Boffin was first recorded in its uh, contemporary form in a Times article in 1945. Boffins were principally responsible for utilising weapons of the ether such as radar and also countering the usage of enemy radar. The military application of radar was envisioned when British post office workers noticed disturbances in radio reception when aircraft flew within the vicinity of their receivers and developed by the Boffins from 1935 onwards. Radar, originally called RDR, an acronym for Radio Detection and Ranging, was attested in this sense in 1941 and first used figuratively by 1950. The Germans made good use of radio navigation to direct their bombers towards British cities at night. Among the first to identify the nature of the threat was R.V. Jones, a notable young military scientist known for his remarkable intellect and rubbing up superior officers the wrong way. Jones spent most of his wartime career at the Air Intelligence Branch of the Secret Intelligence Service. A time of national crisis leads to the competent and capable replacing personnel in important positions who were appointed for more dubious reasons. This pushy boffin correctly determined that the leaked uh, document known as the Oslo Report was genuine, uh, despite being dismissed as misinformation by, the, by his superiors. The document revealed that the Germans were using some kind of electronic night bombing guidance system to direct their aircraft to their target. A German radar system was uh, named a Freya by the Germans after the Norse goddess. German prisoners held in Britain spoke of this mysterious device in aircraft they called uh, x jarret meaning X-apparatus. The idea of something that was that sophisticated being small enough to fit into an aircraft was a revelation at the time. In November 1940, a captured German bomber with a complete ex gerard confirmed the intelligence gathered from the prisoners and validated the intelligence gathering methods. The mysterious device is located in devices disguised as blind landing apparatus. A facility supporting Freya and the German bombing aircraft was located in the northern French town of Bruneville. A commander raided by the Red Berets succeeded in bringing back to Britain key components of the system. Equipment seized by the raiders was examined by R.V. Jones and his team. The equipment seized by the Bruneval raid, the most uh, successful of its kind in the war, enabled the RAF boffins to unlock the secrets of German radar guidance systems. They found that while the equipment was very sophisticated, it had no built-in counter to jamming. The box on the aircraft was disguised as a regular radio receiver. In fact, it was a significantly more sophisticated piece of equipment that, just as the Oslo report had suggested, enabled the aircraft to ride along an electronic beam and notify the crew when they were over the target. The TRE was also developing their own devices of this kind. The Boffords referred to such a device and other secretly installed equipment as a black box. The term was not attested until 1947 in RAF slang due to the sensitive nature of the work involved in such devices. Various World War II era boffins went on to develop the various flight recorders in service today. They were referred to as uh, black not because of their colour, but most likely due to the secrecy of the technology. Modern black boxes and or flight data recorders are typically orange in order to aid identification and recovery. Nonetheless, they are still frequently called black boxes. The war in Europe ended in May 1945, the greatest instance of atrocity, evil, insanity, waste and stupidity the world has ever seen. Japan still held out. Allied leaders met at Potsdam near Berlin and from whence issued an ultimatum declaring that Japan would face utter destruction unless she agreed to unconditional surrender. The Japanese Navy and Air Force were all but destroyed. The Japanese people were starving. Some ate snakes and sparrows to survive. The government began a program to collect acorns to feed its people. The well-equipped and battle-hardened allies faced a fanatical opponent consisting of a large land army numbering 2,350,000 troops and 28 million civilian armed militia were muzzle-loading rifles and bamboo spears. The Battle of Okinawa demonstrated that the Japanese army would still fight fanatically and inflict huge casualties, mostly upon its own civilians, despite having no hope of averting eventual defeat. The Allies were faced with a uh, defeated and dangerous enemy that simply would not surrender.
Thank you.